Uh, I'm Mark, and I'm going to talk about AI-powered business applications. Uh, I was thinking about what Leif was saying about his counting years, and I realized I have a different, different way of counting years. I turned 23 uh, the 15th of October, so about two weeks ago. That's in Vaadin years. Uh, yeah, but kind of before we dive in here, I would like also to kind of get to know a little bit about you guys. So how many have used AI for anything, for fun, for making funny pictures or anything? Pretty much as expected, so everyone at this point. Uh, how many of you have used AI for actual work, for kind of coding, making blogs or something but work? Yeah, yeah, pretty, pretty big chunk of us. Uh, last one, how many have integrated AI into your applications? <laughs> so a little bit less, yeah, that's, that's kind of what we have been seeing. So kind of, um, I'm not a data scientist, it says product strategist, by the way, and uh, again, uh, going back to Leif's points, he is an architect and can simplify things. I'm a strategist, I can complicate things. <laughs> no, no, uh, so I'm not a data scientist. I'm uh, about kind of applying things in practice, thinking about kind of the end users, what can they actually get value out of? So, and I guess that's kind of most of us here. Uh, but if you are kind of anything like me, uh, lately you might have been feeling a little bit overwhelmed with all these AI stuff. So I'm kind of thinking also maybe some of you were kind of planning to do catch up on emails during this talk or something. Oh no, AI again. But yeah, stick me with me because um, uh, like, as I said, it seems like, like every day we are getting some, some news about, yeah, forget ChatGPT, check out this new product, and you have to try these 50 new things to get your work done, and ChatGPT is quaint. Uh, I had to do kind of a last minute check before coming here and see if everything is invalidated. Luckily it's not. Uh, yeah, and we have on, on kind of, on hugging face, there are 350,000 models you can kind of look at. And hugging face, why are we talking about an emoji? So, uh, but I'm kind of today here to tell you that, that we've got this. You and I, we've got this. There's a reason why everything seems so crazy right now. And kind of, there's a reason why now is a really good time to kind of start looking into these things and, and, and doing something about it. So how many of you are familiar with the Gartner hype cycle? Yeah, maybe half? Uh, so I'm just going to quickly go through that. So Gartner is an analyst firm, like many of you probably know, and kind of they have this kind of phases that every new technology go through. So you can kind of expect it to go through these uh, phases. So we have kind of uh, visibility or hype versus time. And at the beginning of it, there's always kind of a technology trigger. It's kind of when uh, people get aware of this new technology and get excited and kind of uh, all this hype starts rising up. And then eventually we reach uh, the peak, the peak of inflated expectations. Uh, so that's when there's like really a lot of stuff going on. Everyone is talking about it and so on. But then kind of there starts to be kind of a little bit of a doubt. Maybe there are some problems with it, but also kind of difficult to figure out uh, how can I apply this? Like, how do you use this? And in my situation, how do I kind of use this? That's when we kind of slide into the trough of disillusionment, which is pretty hard to say as a non-native speaker, by the way. <laughs> I would like Gartner to change a few things here. But anyway, that's kind of when you're kind of really kind of, yeah, this new technology, everyone is talking about it, but all these things I see, how do I apply them? Uh, so the next step is the slope of enlightenment, sounds more positive, uh, and that's kind of when we start finding these use cases, kind of knowing how to apply this in some situations. Uh, and then finally we reach the plateau of productivity when kind of 
all the use cases or many use cases are known. We know kind of, oh, this is this situation. Let's apply this technology in this way. And kind of, does this kind of feel similar at all right now? Like, uh, so yeah, what do you think this is? I guess, yeah. I tried to draw kind of the hype cycle for AI. Uh, so the recent boom that's mostly driven by kind of LLM, like large language models and, and this boom. So uh, it kind of all started here back in 2017 with the attention is all you need paper by some Google folks and they even say it the wrong way around themselves. Uh, all you need is attention, so don't worry if you do that as I usually do. So it was kind of inventing transformers, which is the T in GPT. So pretty important discovery. It's like a huge leap forward. But kind of as you can see, it took a while. Kind of the, the, it's kind of flat, the, the, the curve here, because there was a lot of excitement about this and a really breakthrough, but mostly kind of among uh, data scientists and AI experts. And I've heard that kind of around, they started making like GPT-1 and GPT-2, for instance, and around GPT-2, they started seeing like, yeah, hey, this is actually going to work, this large language model thing. But basically nobody else could use it. You had to kind of make your own scripts to actually use this thing. And so, but then uh, 2022, OpenAI kind of released ChatGPT on an unsuspecting world. And that's kind of when everything changed. So we all got aware of this and everyone started talking about it and kind of uh, this is where we kind of shot up the curve here. And I'd say like depends on who we ask here probably in the spring, during the summer, at least coming back from vacations, you were like, oh, all these new messages every day and you're kind of sliding down that, that slope like, how do I use this? How do I apply it? How, how can I bring this to my users? So I'm kind of saying that we, we are here, we're in the trough. Uh, so that's kind of a bummer, but the, the point here is that uh, this is natural. This is how these things go. And it might feel a little bit hopeless right now, but the only direction is up. Uh, so also kind of AI is not just one thing. It's, so if you look at the Google Trends chart here for, um, or kind of LLMs it, it, it is not the only thing is my point here. So if you look at the Google Trends chart for ChatGPT, it didn't exist for a long time and then boom. Uh, but if we overlay kind of AI, that's a, a trend that's been going on for a really long time. It got boosted a lot by, by, by this. So it's kind of bringing in a lot of people into AI and increasing the interest in it uh, in the whole field. So it's having a lot of effects outside of kind of large language models and people are also finding ways to apply transformers to other things than the LLM. So good to remember that it's not only these chat GPT things. Um, so this is the actual Gartner hype cycle for AI from 2019, there is no generative AI, so no LLMs here. Chatbots seem to be on the top, remember those? Uh, and we're gonna get back to later, kind of following a little bit, uh, computer vision, which is kind of traveling along this, this kind of hype cycle here. So in 2020, uh, generative AI enters the hype cycle and starts climbing, uh, 2021, climbing up a bit still. So Gartner is tracking pretty much everything that's happening. So they, they were kind of following this. Uh, kind of computer vision is going along the trough here. Uh, 2022, uh, still climbing. And also according to Gartner, so this is 2023 from August, I think, uh, they put generative AI at the top uh, here kind of inflated expectations. Uh, so yeah, computer vision meanwhile has been progressing to kind of, we actually know what to do with it. We can use it for things. It's kind of well known. 
Uh, so my point here is it, it depends a lot on kind of the exact flavor of AI you are talking about, how, how mature it is and so on. It depends on your industry and maybe the size of the company. So if you have a department that are data scientists or maybe you don't, uh, depends on the use case you are driving to solve or kind of the use cases in your application. Uh, and kind of the, the recent boom is mostly about large language models and things like that. But this is also about other types of AI and kind of how the whole, whole AI space is getting boosted and actually we're getting more people that can do things in the, in, in the kind of field. So right now kind of our job is to figure out uh, the real use cases for this, kind of how to apply AI to kind of push up the slope of enlightenment here and pull the users along with us and kind of give, a, give them these, these kind of uh, applications that are AI powered. Uh, so this is one of my favorite quotes. It's, it's from 2003, The Economist was interviewing William Gibson. Uh, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. So we are kind of, we here are the ones that are creating uh, software that let people get real work down and kind of keep the world running. So I think it's kind of up to us to kind of, let's figure out how to distribute this kind of new future that we know uh, is here already. It's kind of not just distributed. Uh, so um, some practical examples. And there's kind of, there's plenty of valuable use cases that are not super complex. Like AI can feel quite complex, but there are many things we can do. And I'm gonna show some of those kind of small things. And mostly it's for inspiration. So uh, you are the experts in, in, in your domains. You know your users, you know your application and the kind of problems within that and what the users are trying to solve. So I'm gonna need your help to kind of keep an open mind and kind of think about how could I apply something like this in my application? Is it kind of, are these situations coming up? Could I adjust this a little bit? Uh, so example one, and this is kind of super small one, kind of easy to apply. So if you try one thing going away from here on the train or something, uh, let it be this one because it's using our AI form filler, which is kind of like a, a library. And this particular demo uh, is, is kind of something I did just trying out like when we released the, the library, like hmm, let's, let's try to use this. Uh, and the case is kind of, so imagine you're applying for a job. Uh, what you usually end up doing is you create this really nice PDF with all the information about you uh, and you format it nicely and so on. And then when you're actually about to apply for a job, uh, you go to some site, upload the PDF, and then you input your information, which is basically the same information, but not quite. At the other end, the person who is reviewing these applications, uh, they review kind of filter on the input information and so on, find maybe your, your application, and then they take the PDF and read through it and see what you have actually done. So, and kind of this is a little silly example, but kind of just to give the point, and generally the, the point here is kind of entering data is slow, it's boring, and it's error prone. So maybe we can do something better. So here, I'm kind of copying everything wholesale, select everything and copying it from the PDF into the application. And I press the button, which is using the AI form filler, so an LLM to actually fill the form. And kind of, I didn't have to do anything. And it's really, uh, easy to achieve that and kind of the first time you try it, it, it kind of, it feels, it's a silly little thing, but it feels like magic. So uh, the, the point here is kind of taking unstructured natural language, like 
just copying and pasting everything from the PDF, extract the data and fill, fill the form. And mean, meanwhile, you can also have uh, kind of ask the AI to format the data. Uh, you can ask it to add items to a list. It's not just filling in pre-existing fields. Uh, you can ask it to check boxes and that's pretty lenient so you don't have to match everything exactly. If the person has experience with CSS, uh, the AI will notice that and just check that box, like regardless how they worded that in the PDF. Uh, you can also have it summarize and analyze thing. I'm not really recommending selecting who you hire based on what the AI says. <laughs> so don't do that, but as an example, in many other cases, it's really good to have the AI summarize something and maybe you get kind of a small sanity check about whatever it is you're uh, inputting. Uh, so you take kind of unstructured input uh, and what you want out is kind of structured output that's machine readable you can kind of uh, use in your application. So that's kind of input combi combined with a clever prompt. So it's prompt engineering. And some of the challenges that kind of need to be solved is, is kind of structured is not the default output of a large language model. It tends to give you natural language back. So you need to convince it to be kind of structured. It's not deterministic and that's a big problem when you're trying to code using it. So uh, you need to work around that. And, and kind of, it hallucinates a lot and that's not something we want. So again, that's kind of about prompt engineering and kind of, you can get it to, to give really kind of good results, but by default it doesn't. So you need to, to uh, make sure it does. Uh, but those are not kind of the only problems. So here is kind of seemingly the same situation, seemingly the same PDF. I copy the information into my application, but I actually get wildly different results this time. So it's filling gotcha in each field. And this is kind of a really simple uh, dumb example, but it's about prompt injection, which is a problem you need to watch out for. for. So I just put a hidden message in my PDF that you couldn't see, but is copied into the text and kind of for, formatted so it's overriding the prompt instructions. And this is a really crude kind of simple example, but it's very hard to defend against those. This I could really easily defend against, but you might have seen this Dan prompt and things like this that's about jailbreaking chat GPT and, and kind of getting it to answer anything, even if it's dangerous. And it's a thing that there's no real solution for yet. So, and we're working very hard, like the, the whole kind of AI community about that, but there's no way to be sure that this can't happen. So this is an issue anytime you process kind of user generated content. So the lesson here is always keep the human in the loop not only kind of for this prompt injection, but it's a good idea to like let the AI assist, uh, keep the human responsible for the outcome. So this should be the default. And when you deviate from that, you should think of, kind of deviate with caution. Think about what uh, is there, a, might there be a problem here? Might somebody uh, use this, this uh, in a not so nice way? Uh, so takeaway so far is LLMs can help automate things that were not feasible before, kind of sometimes with real ease, it just works. So there are new use cases we can look at. Uh, prompt engineering is required uh, to minimize these pitfalls that exist and are kind of inherent in, in these large language models. Uh, you also need to define really well the response you want back uh, and validate that so you're able to use it when you're kind of uh, using it in your applications. And again, always keep the human in the loop uh, or kind of deviate with caution for, from that recommendation. And kind of, as I said, the AI form filler makes this really easy to try out and get started. And I do recommend trying it because it takes care about a lot of that so you can just kind of 
try it out and then get kind of some ideas that, ah, maybe I can try this. Uh, so the next example is adding a bit more um, moving parts. And it's kind of, it's a side project of mine, kind of in the coffee room uh, where I sometimes, it's a co-working space where I sometimes work. Uh, and so it came up there and it's for the Association of Swedish Talking Newspapers in Finland. And a talking newspaper is kind of an audio newspaper for visually impaired or kind of, uh, they say, print disabled. So, so you can kind of get an audio version of, of that newspaper. And in Finland, we actually have two uh, official languages. So Finnish, obviously, but there's a 5% Swedish speaking minority. So this is about those kind of Swedish uh, newspapers. So there's not a lot of resources to go around to kind of try to, to make this work. So what they are doing is they, all the newspapers have a web version. So they go and grab kind of the information from the web version. The problem that, that we are talking about is that uh, not everything is available in the web version. So in the PDF kind of that looks like a, a newspaper, there are certain boxes like congratulations and obituaries and things like these that can be really important for these people to, to hear uh, that are not included in the web. Uh, and they also kind of, those things have custom designs which has mean that it it's, doesn't work very well to copy and paste them into kind of the application they use. So they had this problem and, and kind of, yeah, they have editors that are now manually typing these in so they get them into the talking newspaper. Uh, so the idea we came up with is, hey, maybe we could kind of turn the PDF into an image, run object detection, which is about the computer vision we kind of saw earlier. Uh, so we can extract those boxes we are looking for and find them in the uh, newspaper, run OCR on that. Uh, then we can use the LLM actually to do kind of a heavy lifting here to identify what type of, of thing is this? What are we congratulating or something else? And kind of clean up also so that it's able to speak this in a proper way. So kind of document information extraction, but kind of uh, made ourselves here. So, and this is kind of, one point I want to uh, get across here is kind of, so we had this idea like this might be possible. So in the evening at home, I spent two hours kind of trying this manually, like a manual proof of concept. And first step, and don't tell the data scientists this, but I used three images, like three pages from the PDFs, uh, labeled 10 things and trained an object recognition model. And at that point, I was able to kind of, it detected the boxes. It's probably not perfect, but for a proof of concept. Uh, I manually cropped out the sections and put those into a online OCR service. Then I could copy that text into the OpenAI playground and play around with prompts and see kind of, can this do achieve what I'm trying to achieve? Uh, and also kind of at the same time, try to see if I can solve some of those problems where abbreviations like F dot is third in Swedish, which is born, and that's not good when it's kind of read out loud. Uh, so I actually was able to make the LLM just expand that. And also phone numbers that are read out as, you know, 555 million, three, it's not very good, I'm told, in the, in the audio version, but the, the LLM can help with that. Uh, so that's the, the kind of the solution we ended up with here, is kind of first detect those boxes so we can crop them out, run them quickly through OCR. Uh, the LLM tells us, is this a newborn person we're talking about or a deceased person? It's pretty bad mixing those up one way. It's even worse the other way. So, um, and it can uh, expand the abbreviations and, and kind of clean up and format everything. So, and back we get a structured response again, and we are able to pre-fill 
the tool they use to uh, create this kind of talking newspaper. So they still have the editors kind of going through um, everything that's going into the final product, but they don't have to do the manual work. So human in the loop again. And this is kind of also about com combining kind of uh, more mature technologies with some of these more cutting edge technologies. And then you can kind of achieve sometimes a, a, a more valuable solution and kind of work around some of those things that are problems with just the one technology. Uh, so there's a lot of potential, I think, for this. This was a very specific example, but it's kind of not only to, if you have problems with PDFs, it can be other kind of images and text and so on. So not only running it through OCR, maybe you get bills, invoices, or things like this that you, you can use some of this for. The point is to go from kind of unstructured to structured and, and kind of clean, you can also clean up and format things and run some sanity checks on, on if this seems to be working. Uh, so yeah, and the one point is that the LLM understands context. So it's really good at kind of finding things that were very difficult to programmatically pick out of text, like the phone numbers I mentioned. Uh, it's just a number. It's going to be really difficult to know if, if you know, what type of number this is. Meanwhile, the, the large language model has no problem seeing that, yeah, this is a phone number in this context. Uh, so the takeaway is kind of, again, summarizing here. Um, combine kind of technique, other techniques with a large language model that might uh, kind of achieve a, a, a bigger value and kind of unlock things that you couldn't do previously. Uh, do manual proof of concepts with these things. So uh, if you have an idea and you kind of put it in the open AI playground and play, play around with it a little bit, uh, the, the kind of the results, what you can achieve can be pretty eye-opening. And again, kind of the LLM can recognize things a lot better than, or kind of, it's really difficult to achieve the same thing programmatically because it's context aware. So a lot of solutions you can bring from unfeasible to feasible. Things we were like, yeah, this is a problem for our users, but they'll have to do it manually. We might be able to do. So kind of keeping an open mind and thinking like, how might we fix these if we have this AI doing it? But again, remember to keep the human in the loop. Uh, this example is something completely different. It's just kind of, it's a prototype I made, kind of an idea, an experiment, but it's about querying and filtering data. And I think you probably have many such solutions in your applications already. So you know that kind of querying and filtering data, uh, it can get complex quite quickly. Uh, and it's kind of, Usually it's not a good idea to have users type in SQL. So we tend to kind of create this, some sort of query builder, but that's also, it's not the easiest thing to use, kind of a little bit of a learning curve for the users and kind of putting in ands and ords and so on and, and kind of understanding precedence can be hard. So it's a UX challenge. So what if we could kind of let the AI help the user here? So this is kind of a contacts application. I just used one of our examples as a starting point. Each contact has kind of a list, if you click on it, with kind of when I've been in contact with them. So that's the idea. And I can kind of uh, type in here, uh, oops. I can type in in natural language, like here, in-person entry in the last month. I press the help me button, which configures the query builder and then I can, okay, that looks about right, so I can run the query and see that I get the results and kind of check out if, if that's what I wanted. And of course, I can kind of make it a little bit more complex. So here it's our email in the last two months. I was gonna do live coding, but you never know with this. <laughs> so yeah, here we get a little bit more complex thing that's configured quite quickly. 
and kind of I get some more results and can kind of, if I want to, again, verify that is it actually giving the results uh, I want. And kind of, you can go how, however deep you want. So here's kind of a, a neat thing I typed in or mentioned, what did I think? Or mentioned in conversation. So then it actually kind of a little bit guesses what, I, what the data model actually contains and, and kind of, or actually guesses what I'm meaning by that. Uh, also, if you kind of notice that it did something wrong, it's easy to change that natural language and kind of see how it affects. So it could also be kind of a learning thing, like how do you use this query builder uh, thing? So maybe if that a little bit more slowly. So in the first thing I said, in person entry in the last month, and the AI knows kind of it knows the database here. I kind of told it, yeah, I have this. Actually, I did a simple version, so it knows the beginning of the select. But anyway, you can kind of tell it, this is the data model I have. Uh, and kind of it knows that, yeah, a contact has many entries that has a type, a date, and a description. And that's kind of all I give to it. Uh, based on that, it can configure the components in the query builder. And then I can kind of press query to run it. Um, the second part I added is slightly more kind of vague because I didn't say anything about an entry I said or email in the last two months, but that doesn't matter. The LLM is context aware. It, it kind of knows what I mean. Uh, the last part or mentioned in conversation is kind of getting interesting because at no point did I tell the AI what I've been typing in my kind of notes about these people. Uh, so it kind of guesses that, yeah, you have kind of a description here in the entries, you probably want to search that, and that's kind of a like query. Um, and kind of, as I said, uh, change the or to an and here, and that's kind of intentionally being ambiguous. Uh, so, but you can kind of see how the, the AI interpreted this. So you have kind of or, and then you have and, is it, you know, what's the precedence? But the good thing with kind of putting it in the query builder is that you can see what the AI is doing and kind of verify this is what you want to do and make changes quickly if, if that's not what you actually wanted to do. Um, if you have some sort of query builder or filter or something like this, in your application and kind of, I'm imagining reporting, charts, dashboards, and so on. This is probably quite low hanging fruit at this point. Uh, a, a big part of the work here is kind of making a query builder. If you have that already, integrating an AI that can configure it and help the users are, are kind of, I think that would, is kind of low hanging fruit to try, could we do this? Uh, because it's, it's surprisingly good uh, at these things. Um, so I'm not going to dive very deep on code here, but, and actually maybe I should at this point tell you that it was already mentioned, but tomorrow Marcus has uh, a presentation which is about making a knowledge based system, AI based knowledge based system. And that can be really interesting. And he's showing uh, much more about uh, kind of how to implement that. So that's kind of an additional example. Um, the resume reader I showed is on my GitHub. So you can go check that out. It's using the, the form filler, so, so kind of, it's really easy to, to uh, use that and see how it works. Um, I'm gonna show you just really quickly how easy it might be, so I could maybe pu push somebody over the edge to actually try it out. So the resume reader, if you have forgotten, <laughs> it's copying the text into uh, the application and filling the form. Uh, and that's a one-liner. I give, 
I tell the form filler my layout where I have my fields and then I give the text I got from the PDF and that's it, I'm done. It's filling the form. Um, in addition, I can give it some hints. So it turned out in my testing with different PDFs I, and resumes I found on the internet that people tend to, they want to make their resume look visually pleasing, which means they do strange things to email addresses and things like this, so spaces between every character and so on. So I gave the LLM some in instructions to, to make it into a valid email and kind of remove these things. And at that point, I need to remind it not to hallucinate as well. <laughs> so, but then it works. It's, it's cleaning up those that I could find very, very well. Um, the last thing here is you can give it some general instructions, like what are you actually looking at here? What are you trying to achieve? That tends to improve uh, the results, like how good it is at achieving um, the results you are trying to achieve. And more information about the AI form filler is available in the Vadin docs, so it's kind of tools, AI form filler. Uh, and I just wanted to especially highlight the, the link here to the GitHub re repository. Um, because it actually has some advanced examples, so I'm going to show you where to look for those. Uh, if you dig in to the demos or examples we have there, uh, you go to the kind of find the views where the real interesting stuff is happening. You'll find these three examples, and two of them are using kind of external services to run things through OCR and so on. So those are kind of, uh, if you don't, like my example was only using text, but if you have some uh, images or PDFs or something that you would like to try with, uh, there are some ready-made examples for that to kind of integrate uh, with that. Um, and kind of, now what? Uh, we have seen kind of why it's crazy right now. We have seen kind of why it's a good time right now to actually start doing something. And also kind of we have seen that it can be quite easy to, to get started. So it's kind of, it's up to us now to start building these AI powered business applications. Um, let's share ideas and kind of use cases and lesson learned and, and, and so on. Uh, I'm really interested in hearing your thoughts on this and kind of, especially if you have some sort of idea that maybe this could work or kind of how could I do this case or uh, something you're working on already or just thinking about maybe this could be possible. Uh, because as I said, like it's, it's quite, when you have this idea, there might be ways to kind of quickly uh, try it out, make a quick manual proof of concept and kind of, when we are talking to each other, it turns out that some of us have, have already been doing these things. Uh, so, so kind of sharing experiences and how do you actually avoid those hallucinations and uh, funny stories, stories about that, that can help everyone. So I'll be kind of, I'll be around obviously all the time, so feel free to grab me and just kind of, if you feel like discussing uh, some of these topics. Um, and kind of, this is just kind of, again, kind of getting back to summarizing some of the top takeaways. Uh, we can use uh, LLMs to help users with tasks that were kind of not previously feasible. So you can kind of start to look for these cases where it's kind of, maybe you have been wanting to help the user or you know they are doing kind of, uh, kind of several steps manually that maybe could be automated but it's been difficult or uh, these cases where 
the user would want some intern to just give an instruction to like, can you just go through all these things and update it according to this? Uh, those might be able, you might be able to kind of automate these if you kind of start looking into it. Um, there are some pitfalls with these technologies that you need to avoid, but we can avoid those quite easily right now if you kind of uh, keep the user in the loop and, and keep the AI as kind of a co-pilot and, and kind of an assistant. And the human is kind of responsible uh, for kind of pressing the button or kind of the fi final outcomes. And if you do that in kind of, think about the UX, the kind of UI, that it actually helps you out filling in things or configuring things and so on. And then you can verify that was this uh, well, was this a good outcome now and press the button or maybe adjust something. That's kind of sidestepping a, a, a lot of those kind of uh, dangers that might exist with this. Um, and, and kind of again pointing back to um, before building anything, uh, it's really good to kind of manually prototype these steps. So, so kind of, you have, maybe you have this idea that, that could we do X? Like you wake up at night, hmm, maybe I can fix this. Try it, try it in the open AI playground and see kind of try part of it and see, hmm, does it give some results I can work with? You, you might be surprised how well it works. Uh, so you can kind of, uh, you can assess the, the feasibility and the potential of kind of your idea. And once you're kind of confident that you know kind of these are the problems, these are kind of you test with a little bit more materials and kind of, okay, I need to adjust this. But once you're kind of confident that you know where the, the problems are, where the limits are, and that you can be, um, you can solve this building, then you can start building and actually making the solution. And it's it's, really easy to do this with this. And again, you are the domain expert, you're uniquely positioned to help your users harness the power of AI. So the, the patterns are kind of similar between all of us and maybe the small examples I showed, but it's you who know how to apply that in your situation, in your, your domain. So again, kind of the AI powered future is already here. Uh, Let's work together to distribute some of that to our users. And that's all I have. Do we have time for questions or we had some? Okay, yes, good. I was trying to go fast because we were running late. So apparently Tarek looks very satisfied. <laughs> it's a good sign. So yeah, we have time for some questions. Uh, GitHub link, this one. Uh, so yeah, that's my repository. I'm eMark on GitHub. It's pinned right now on my GitHub. And there should be a link to uh, the documentation for the AI form filler. And kind of, uh, yeah, the example here should be pretty easy to follow. It's just based on a basic starter and then doing this kind of one view. Uh, so that's one place you can start. Yep. Is there any uh, way or option right now to use existing wiki data, for example, to train a chatbot locally on prem with Vadi, or do you have to have a cloud connection going to a, a third party server that chat GPT get knows it that yeah, so the question was if there's a way to uh, use some data to train a local model uh, instead of going to the cloud again. And yeah, I think this is, we hear this question a lot and kind of it's, uh, yeah, because of privacy and the types of applications we are doing and so on. So yes, you can, but it's not very easy right now. Uh, for the AI form filler, the default is to use open AI now. It's like easy, you just put in your key and it's ready to go. But it's made in a way so you can configure it. 
So if you have some other model, like say Llama or something, which you can actually run locally, uh, you can use that. If you use something like Mistral, it has a very specific type of prompt you have to put to it. So then you have to adjust a little bit how the prompt is built. Uh, but the thing is, it's a large language model. So it's pretty large. Uh, <laughs> So, so many of these, there has been a lot of work going on right now with kind of minimizing these and uh, compressing them. And you, have the small, you can have the smaller version. And you kind of need to try out yourself if it's able to kind of solve your use case. I can run a model on my computer, but it's not very fast. And it's nowhere near as good as chat GPT or GPT-4. Uh, but then again, you can fine tune the model. Training a large language model, I don't recommend, but fine tuning it. So with your data and adding if it's bad, that you can do. But still, it's a little bit uh, tricky to run these yourselves. You, you need some serious hardware for it to be fast and so on. But it's also developing very quickly. So yeah, hope that answers.